Modern giraffes are tall, herbivorous mammals that live in Africa. Despite the fact that they are simply incredible, beautiful animals, I chose this group for a reason. Giraffes have fallen within the sights of creationists because creationists believe that giraffes have parts that are irreducibly complex, or the parts can't be broken down into their constituent parts and remain functional. More specifically, creationists look at the structure of the giraffe's long neck and surmise, wrongly as usual, that such a neck couldn't evolve. What do I mean? Karen Viette is a writer, that's about the nicest thing I can say regarding her abilities, whom we met when we discussed elephant evolution. She claimed that there was zero evidence of the evolution of the elephant's trunk in the fossil record, which we disproved in short order. Now she's waving another set of embarrassingly flawed arguments, this time concerning the giraffe, in an article titled, Giraffes, Towering Testimonies to God's Design. Like her elephant article, she does a fine job for upwards of 75% of the paper, merely describing giraffe physiology and behavior, and only faltering in the end when she attempts to give explanations for the giraffe's neck. Let's take a look. Like the elephant article, she claims there are no fossils of the giraffe's evolution and keeps trucking right along. Don't worry, we'll get back to those non-existent fossils. She says with regard to the giraffe's titanic neck, quote, Evolutionists also encounter a design dilemma for the evolution of a long neck. That six-foot neck requires an intricate blood vessel system to maintain proper blood pressure between the heart and brain. A giraffe bending its neck down to drink water is a marvelous display of design. The 25-pound heart that pumps blood way up that neck against gravity suddenly pumps down with gravity, which should cause the delicate brain to explode. But the blood vessels are uniquely designed with reinforced walls, bypass valves, a cushioning web, and sensor signals to moderate the pressure when the giraffe bends its neck down. The reverse of this intricate system happens when the giraffe raises its head so that the pressure is regained and the giraffe doesn't pass out." Close quote. Let's go for the jugular, as it were. This argument assumes that the long neck evolved first and totally independently of the blood vessel system, which relies on a fallacious understanding of evolution. Evolution doesn't necessitate that each part must evolve one at a time, as though these structures would get in line to evolve. Rather, we understand that multiple parts evolve simultaneously. For example, when humans breed dogs, they don't breed for a certain height first, and then breed for a certain color second, and then breed for a certain behavior third, etc. Instead, the features are bred in concert. The same is true of the giraffe's neck. As it happens, heroically handsome naturalist Charles Darwin explained back in 1868 how the giraffe's neck could have evolved. So it would appear that, as usual, creationists are far behind the data curve, in this case 150 years behind. What a surprise. To quote Talk Origins, quote, The different features could have, and almost certainly would have, evolved both simultaneously and gradually. Partial valves would have been useful for reducing blood pressure to a degree. An intermediate heart would have produced enough pressure for a shorter neck. A smaller net of blood vessels in the head could have handled the lesser pressure. As longer necks were selected for, all of the other components would have been modified bit by bit as well. In other words, for each inch that the neck grew, the giraffe's physiology would have evolved to support such growth before the next inch of neck growth." Close quote. Thus, Viet's blood pressure argument is drained. Anti-evolutionists will also try to cite the ID proponent Wolf Eckhard Lonig to combat giraffe evolution, but unsurprisingly, he noticeably skirts the paleontological data. So let's get back to Viet's claim regarding the fossil data. Quote, the proposed progression from short to long neck giraffes is absent from the fossil record. Close quote. But before we can tackle the fossils, some phylogenetics need to be managed. Giraffes are members of the mammalian superorder Laurasiatheria, 
and they fall within an order of Laurasia theria called set artiodactyla, which means the even-toed ungulates that includes camels, deer, cows, pigs, hippos, whales, etc. Giraffes and their kin break off from the other artiodactyls at 22.2 million years ago, or the early Miocene, forming the superfamily Giraffoidea. Modern members of Giraffoidea include the pronghorn, acope, and, of course, giraffe. Or giraffes. Morphology had already placed the acope with giraffe, which was then confirmed by genetics, and later the North American pronghorn was added to the group on the basis of genetics, originally having been mistaken for some kind of deer. Since its first observation, several fossil species of ancient pronghorn have been discovered, possessing a variety of antler arrangements, such as tetramerics. And giraffes share a common ancestor with pronghorns that lived about 16.8 million years ago. Immediately, we see that the base of the giraffoidea tree has small, deer-like mammals, not huge giraffes. This makes sense given that giraffes are sister to the lineage containing deer, and the diminutive mouse deer are sister to the lineage containing giraffes and deer. As we move towards the giraffes and acope, we see a succession of deer-like forms, such as the Climacoceratids. These first appeared in the early Miocene and didn't have the giraffe neck. However, they had large ossicones, or antlers, on their heads. Prolibitherium is currently classified as a Climacoceratid, but has encountered cladistic difficulties in the past due to being somewhat like a deer and somewhat like a giraffe. Again, that makes sense because giraffes are surrounded by deer-like relatives. Moving on, researchers surmise that giraffes and the acope are descended from a group called Canthumericidae, with acope and giraffes splitting around 6.48 million years ago. From there, paleontologists have noted a series of increasingly modern giraffe-like vertebrae from Canthumerix to Giraffacarix to Samotherium to Paleotragus to Bolinia to Giraffa civilensis to modern giraffes. What we see is a very gradual evolution of vertebrae length and width that corresponds to neck length. So no transitional fossils, right? Paleontologists have even learned that where Giraffa lived corresponded to the biome. For example, Giraffa is descended from Bolinia in Asia and migrated to Africa about 7 million years ago following the expansion of scrub or woodland terrain. So we see that the change in vegetation affected giraffes. The transition from a forest lifestyle to a savanna one is probably what fueled the lengthening of the neck. Isn't paleontology grand? Thus, Karen Viette is left with two options. She either didn't do any research into giraffe evolution, which I can believe given that her only citation is a page from the Institute for Creation Research, authored by creationist Brian Thomas, or she knew about the fossils and lied. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and just say that she chose not to do adequate research. But you now know the facts surrounding giraffe evolution. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.